Good evening, everyone. Time for episode 16 of the Drums of Doom, part 2 of the Dwaradheem Staff Saga. By me, starting on page 198, the chapter entitled Dard Plots. <clears throat> All right. Agoric and his advisors planned at length regarding the deal that they had made with the son of Akron. The eyes of living surface dwellers had never before seen Grulthank, and Agoric did not intend for such an event to occur now. Countless tunnels and bridges spanning wide expanses of molten lava surrounded the citadel. A maze of lethal traps, deadfalls, and pitfalls warded these ways. There were safe paths through them, and only the dark knew those routes. One of them, Dirn Channel, led to the cavern system through which Vlad's foreigners were traveling. Indeed, Agoric's miners had heard many strange vibrations through the stone from that region, and it was within Dirn Channel that he intended to ambush these travelers. If any of them strayed from the path, they would find certain doom. For to the east and west of that tunnel maze lay an endless array of deadly traps that the dark had labored for centuries to create. If they wandered off the path, there would be no saving these surfacers. Agoric hoped that they would wander. We will have to gain their confidence, said his rightmost adviser. They are naive children of the light, said Agoric. Use the cavern creatures to lure them, said his leftmost adviser. Disguise the miners, Agoric said. Use the creatures sent to lure the beasts. Send the poisoners to help with the capture. An excellent plan, my king. Carry them beyond our lands. Leave the surfaces at the base of Cleve Maga, neither maimed nor pillaged. Do this, and the blood debt to Lucheron will be paid. Betray them, said his leftmost. What need do the dog have for Lucheron? Torture them, said his rightmost. Mutilate them. You forget the pact of the blood debt, said Agoric. To forget the pact is to lose the favor of Abathorius. What care does he have for surfacers? For them he cares nothing, said Agoric, but for the pact of blood, everything. Yes, my king. If my instructions are disobeyed, said Agoric, every dog in that company will be tortured. They will be maimed and they will be mutilated unto death. That is the word and pact of Agoric. It shall be done, my king. A daughter to the queen. Ariana's beauty was supernatural, and within her chambers at the heart of Dracon Mjolfalor, she was the closest to her power, linked in spirit to Lothdea, goddess of the great spider. Scrimsh, her pet's giant spider, feasted in his own dark and well-surrounded cave at the rear of her quarters. He was the member of a rare phylum of under-earth spiders, a family of both enormous and deadly proportions. The human male that he was devouring had proven to be a most exciting and virile partner to couple with. In her enchanting and charmed embrace, he had performed admirably, admirably, at least until his heart failed. No matter, there were plenty of fine humans in the slave pits to choose from, and Scrimsh needed feeding at least once a week anyway. Lothdea had shared the experience with her, and she was pleased. Lying back upon her soft sheet spun of spider's silk, she traced the firm flesh of her blanket-shrouded body and closed her eyes to commune with her goddess, an experience of ecstatic bliss greater even than her concubines could provide. I am pleased, daughter. Vlad will join us soon, mother. He is ambitious and may soon be a danger to us. By then he will be in my control. I trust in your abilities, Ariana, but the time has come for you to know my wishes. Yes, mother. I have foreseen that he may one day unite the staff. See to it that he brings it to me. If not willingly, then kill him. But what of the parliament? Ariana asked. They are nothing compared to the might of the staff, and if Vlad gives it up willingly, then what is to become of him? After that, he is no longer of use to us. He must fall like his father. Yes, mother, she said faithfully. Bring me the staff, daughter, 
and I will make you high priestess, and all pleasures shall be yours. I'll not fail you. A trap is laid. <clears throat> How goes the preparations, Derek? Excellent. The first and second battalions are on full alert. <clears throat> the third battalion will remain ready for the initial assault in the lower levels. Remember, Derek, we must take them alive. Andriul has divined that without them we shall all die on the ice moon. The orcs have been fully briefed, Commander. A fine trap has been set, and only rounded clubs and dulled swords shall be used. Each company must have magic enough to oppose them. Every squad has at least one priest, and each company four war masters. Chieftains? The third battalion has four chiefs. All of them are hand-picked from the drums of doom. They are all veterans of war. Reinforce them. Even at that strength, it may not be enough to capture them alive. Perhaps if the force is great enough, they will surrender. That would be against their very nature, Vlad said, pondering. But it is possible that they might accept defeat once they realize that we possess so many of their loved ones as hostages. Let us hope that Olak and Draco succeed in Arundel. We must prepare our plan, considering their failure. Chief Kegporter may be enough all by himself, but I will soon secure another. My father once knew the gnome's master. They will not be willing to sacrifice their dearest loved ones. Elric desires to use one of his spell traps to capture them. He claims that he can snare them all without harming them. <clears throat> Such an action will rob us of the psychological victory that we need, Vlad said. It must be a military action. He must act only as a last resort. We shall double our preparations, Commander. We must also triple the production of the mine. I fear that the recent actions by Jason de Gaulle may soon rekindle to the Sentian Wars. The deep gnomes have unearthed the largest vein of crystal ever discovered. Our reserves of ore exceed fourteen tons, and the mine continues to produce ever greater concentrations of ore. The jewelers must produce amulets enough for the entire garrison. If the sentients attack, they will strike here first, in search of Ilion's sword. That will, be, that will greatly reduce our supplies of silver and gold. Victory must be ours no matter what the cost. Then I must tell you of my latest experiments. So you have succeeded in empowering the dead with Dark Force Crystal. I have achieved results beyond my wildest dreams. Witness the power of my pawn. It was then that it stepped from the shadows of Derek's laboratory. Once human, life had long since fled the corpse, but some power of animation now inhabited it. Its eye sockets burned with the ill light of undeath, but unlike zombies, created solely through spells, a dark intelligence inhabited this one. Strangely, the stench of death was no longer present. Something was preventing the body's further decay. Can it speak? Yes, Commander. He turned to the corpse. Tell Commander Vlad your name and your purpose. I am Pawn. My purpose is to serve my creator. You walk a dangerous path, dangerous path, Derek. There are few risks, Vlad. The original soul has fled. Pawn is an empty vessel, free of emotion. The power of my spells have animated the corpse. The crystal only preserves its flesh. Amazingly, its reflexes are nearly the same as it possessed in life. It feels no pain, knows no fatigue, and is unrelenting in the pursuit of its commands. Once released, it will never stop unless it is destroyed. How long does the crystal's power last? Pawn is the first, and he has remained fully animated for a week thus far. What do you intend to do with him? He is the prototype. But I intend to make more as fresh corpses become available. I can imagine scores of uses, from untiring assassins to front rank shock troops. Our enemies will flee in terror. Take care, Derek. Necromancy has always been the most unpredictable form of magic. Have no fear. I have begun new experiments combining the magical machines that I recovered from Imperium and the necromantic art. The creation of Pawn was child's play by comparison. An acolyte could have applied Dark Force Crystal as I have. Hardly, Vlad chuckled. But we must return to more urgent matters. 
Step up the patrols of the outer tunnels. We will need as much advance notice as possible to tighten the noose properly. The slaves should lure them in. They won't be able to resist the opportunity for a heroic rescue. Such a weakness, Vlad mused, in the Lyle Selfar and their friends. No Dracanoa would ever jeopardize his mission in that way. We might. Preposterous. Such is the way of the gods of light. Perhaps. Commander, speak freely, Derek, and may rank never come between us. I believe that Ariana's participation in our plans is most treacherous. Ariana isn't the problem. Her inner voice is. Should we take action? We'll wait for now. The time will come for the right moment to act. Soon our power will threaten to tip the balance away from the Queen's loyal followers. Without a doubt, she will command our immediate sacrifice. But that is not for the good of Dagonia, and it certainly is not good for us. In time, Derek, you and I shall stand behind the, the Dragonian army in victory, and no gods, save the ones of our own choosing, will stand with us. The Queen's influence is strong. More than likely, we will fail and be sacrificed to the Great Spider. Dragonia and the Dark Alpha need a new world order, one which can be achieved only through the most daring measures. Our government, our gods, and our laws must change. In order to accomplish this, we must transform the hearts and minds of our entire people. It may be fool a foolish dream of a few. It may be impossible, but that is why we must unite the Dwaradim staff. The Queen's declaration of war may delay our plans. My plan will use the coming war to our advantage. Time is our greatest enemy. We must capture the gem of the staff and the party before the spring thaw. So the invasion of Ferminor begins. The Queen commands us to invade and occupy Safe Haven. The Navy will land our legions on the west coast. Shock troops will attack inland from under Earth, and the remaining fleet will create chaos across the seas. Step by step, the Queen intends to end the war with this one massive offensive. The conquest of Ferminor seems improbable. It is a vast land, as big as Dragonia. We have used these tactics in the past, Vlad said. The last invasion cost my father his life. Then how can we win? We have new and greater allies than ever before in our history. The people of Dragonia, who are once our enemies, now battle with us side by side. Even here in the desolate tundra, we have forged a new partnership with the orcs. The giants of the mountains have sworn fealty and offered to join in our war so long as they can share in the plunder. With proper leadership, the element of surprise and a little luck, we can win. Then we have much work to do. I say hail to Vlad, commander and friend of Derek Aluan. In their firm clasp of forearms held no poison daggers. We are Drakkar Noir. We have our duty to the Empire. Can we find a way to accomplish our goals and free our people? Only time will tell, my friend, he said as he stood. But for now, I must travel to Waysboro. I have important business there. Waysboro? Waysboro. Stepping into shadow, he was gone. Rock of granite, hammers of steel. They were on the move, cautiously following Kerr's lead into the darkest bowels of under-earth. The tunnel leaving the guardroom seemed for the moment endless. Cool air still flowed past them. The draft is a boon, Kerr whispered to Tarek. The wind will carry our scent and the sounds of our passing back to where we've been and away from those below. Fearing that someone may falter from sickness and be lost, Kerr often signaled the halt and ordered a head count. The supply of healing tea was running out, and their fevers would soon end their march. I pray that we can find more medicine, Carmen said. They'll not last much longer. We'll not die from fever, Kerr said. We live by the sword. Press on. Perhaps it was the fever, but Kalor's mind had begun to wander. Part of him was still in file, following last in the column behind Karina. The other half of his psyche contemplated Modril's Book of Shadows. Among the worm's spell repertoire 
were mighty spells of rock and matter manipulation, as well as charming spells and other magic of an unpredictable nature. Sorting through them, he tried to imagine their practical applications, for many of the spells were of untold power, and their uses could not be taken lightly. One day, he or Dao would have to use them, of that he was sure. Ahead of him, Karina was beginning to stagger, her breath laboring. Dao would often help her along until she felt strong enough to go on alone. <clears throat> But his strength was in fact little better than hers. Kalor could only imagine how his friends ahead were faring. He knew that it was only a matter of time before the disease would force an end to their march. It seemed like hours, but time was beyond their fevered grasp. One hour's rest, Kerr called back, and they all slumped gratefully to the floor. Keep it quiet. We'll need real rest soon, Carmen said. My head aches so badly that I, cannot, that I can barely see. Our only hope is to find more of the fungus, Kerr said. If we rest too long, we will all sleep the long sleep. If I must die this way, then may Odin guide us swiftly, Dartin said. It's been far too long since I've had a full night of drink and song. My thirst is great. Don't you have to die in battle with the sword in your hands, asked Leander. We'll battle this sickness until the end, and we still have our swords. We will go on, Kerr said. If I have to carry you all, testing the edge of his axe with his thumb, he then said, Corin Koth is hungry still. Looking at him fearfully, none of them knew if it was Kerr or his axe that had spoken. Only Kerr's great skills at navigating in the Underearth could save them from becoming hopelessly lost, but the ancient magic of the scepter still glowed brightly within its gem, and its insistent pull proved that they still followed the correct path. We're still heading south, Kerr told them. It is time. Let's get moving. They journeyed on for several more hours, and in their wretched states, it seemed more like days, each step harder to make than the last. The long passage gradually ended, entering a twisted maze of caverns and precipitous ledgeways. Look hard to the walls, Kerr said. The fungus often grows in damp caverns such as these. Stopping suddenly, he raised his hands to silence them. His hand to silence them. Listen closely. The sound of hammers upon stone. They could all hear it clearly now, wondering with both curiosity and dread. <clears throat> who would mind way down here, Carmen whispered. Only those who dwell here, Kerr said. There are many different races. Gnomes, dwarves, and the dark Elfar. There are others whose names I dare not mention. We must be prepared for battle. Battle, Dal said. I can barely stand. If we turn back now, without medicine, we will never make it. Courage, Tarek said. Perhaps these miners will be friendly to us. If we're lucky, they may have medicine. You must be sick, Carmen said. Just trying to be hopeful, he answered with a smile. Lead on, Kerr. Kalor, activate the scepter once more. Ahead and south it still pointed. They moved more slowly now, as quietly as they could, and soon came upon the mouth of another tremendous shaft. But this was not a passage naturally formed. Attached to the ceiling above were great pulley mechanisms with rotten strands of rope dangling from them. Once they would have supported immense weight, but their time of glory was long past. The square shaft descended an untold distance. Even with the helm, I cannot see the bottom. The steady sound of miners' picks and hammers echoed eerily from below. Peering into the shaft, Kayla was troubled. What do you think is down there, Kerr? This close to the orc's territory? Who can guess, he said. It could be a gnomish troop, or even dwarves. But I have never heard of any of my kind living beneath the northern reaches, at least not since ancient times. Carmen saw the troubled look upon Kerr's face, and she knew that his optimistic words were not his full thoughts. What is it, Kerr? Dwarves and gnomes aren't the only peoples who mine. We must beware. The answers await us at the bottom. Get your ropes out. Preparing their climbing equipment, they were soon ready to descend. We've got eight coils of rope, Kalor said, over three hundred feet in all. I have tied them all together and anchored it well to a huge docking pin beside the mine shaft. It'll hold two or three men at once. 
but we have no way of knowing if it will reach the bottom. That's great, D'Artin said. Nothing like a 300-foot climb down and then up again if we end up dangling. Well, Dow said, who wants to go first? I'll lead, Kerr said, and take Karina with me. If I have to, I should be able to carry her weight and mine. I don't know if I can make it, Karina said, shivering. You can do it, Kerr said. Think only of the rope and imagine that your body is light, weightless. I'll stay below you. If you fall, we both fall. Very well, Mr. Dwarf, she said. I'll soon be dead of this fever anyway. Why not risk a fall? Why indeed, Kerr replied, as he slowly lowered himself over the rim and into the pit. Karina followed a short distance behind him, and the others waited for the telltale tug in the rope that would be the ready signal for the next two climbers to descend. Kerr examined the complex workings of the mine as he climbed down. Side passageways crisscrossed the shaft in a seemingly random fashion. They must be mining probes, he thought, following the veins of ore. During its heyday, the mighty lift above them must have hummed with a life all its own, but now it rested, torn, ruined, in silent, lonely slumber. Hearing Karina's groan, he paused long enough for her to reach him. Tapping upon her ankles, he placed them left and right atop of his shoulders. When they were stable, he began to climb again. He was strong, doubly so for a dwarf, but whether or not his strength would be enough to carry them both to the bottom, he could not know. But neither did he tell that to Karina. They had come too far to turn back now. There was no other way. Their rope had to reach the bottom. The alternative was unthinkable. Hand over hand, the rope double-wrapped around his stout legs and braced between his boots, he climbed. With Karina atop him, fifty feet, a hundred, two hundred, and nearly three hundred feet, they finally reached the bottom, a broad, sandy cave with several tunnels leading this way and that. The sounds of mining emanated most strongly from the southmost one. He prayed that the miners' industry of sounds would help to cover the noise of their climbing. Two tugs, followed by three, and the next two climbers began their slide, and so on, until all eight of them had reached the bottom. With an amazing skill, Kalo was somehow able to loosen the topmost knot from the rope's end, and over three hundred feet of it fell about them in a heap. Very stealthy, Kerr whispered. Pick up your ropes, he signaled to them all, and then toward Kalor in the south passage. Scout it quietly, he indicated. I didn't want to have to climb back up anyway, Leander said. Don't you know it yet, Darton asked. What? This is a one-way trip. Quiet, men, Kerr ordered. Speak no more. He waved Kalor on and the little thief slunk ahead. Following the tunnel for some distance, he found no evidence of nearby enemies or hidden traps. Several empty carts rested on a well-worn set of rails, traversing the center of the passage. The tracks were dust-free, and the cart's wheels well-oiled. He advanced more carefully, then, ever closer to the miners. Fifty yards, a hundred, one fifty. His footfalls muffled by soft dirt and dust. He moved so closely to the tunnel wall that he was almost a part of it, and then he saw them. In numbers, there were at least twenty, with perhaps ten or more working down side tunnels that he could not see. Several small lanterns bathed the surroundings in a gold glow, and the dull gleam of natural gemstones twinkled here and there throughout the passage. In stature, they were short, a little taller than he was, and bearded, with hawkish noses and piercing black eyes. Their clothing was simple, baggy pants, waist-length tunics, and soft, pointed caps. A few of them wore assorted pieces of armor, a chestplate here, a coat of mail there, and some of them carried short swords belted at their hips. If he were to guess, he would say that they were gnomes, but it was difficult to tell at this distance. He dared not go further ahead and risk discovery. Creeping backward, he moved until he was well beyond any natural sight before turning around and sneaking back to the party. He soon reached them and relayed all that he had seen ahead. So you think that they are gnomes, eh, Kerr said? They look like my people, but they seem older somehow. It is said that the deep gnomes look that way, Kerr said. Life down here is hard and often short. 
But still you worry, Carmen asked. There are other more dangerous races down here that also could be mistaken for gnomes, Kurt said. It would be better if we could find some way to go around them. We've come so far already, and we've long since passed beyond our map. Kalor, can we risk a little light? They're about two hundred yards ahead. They might see the light, but only if they are looking directly towards us. I don't think that we have any other choice, Carmen said. What do you think, Kerr? Try the scepter. If we have to fight in our condition, we're in big trouble anyway. Magical light soon illuminated the maze of mining passages, heading off to the four corners all around them. Much as they feared, the diamond's light pointed south, directly toward the miners. When Kalo commanded the scepter to cease, the dreadful darkness returned. I'll scout ahead, Kalo said. If any of them saw me, they might set an ambush ahead of us. We'll give you a short head start, Kerr said, and then we'll set out after you. Turning to each of them, he made sure that they all knew that from there on, it was hand and arm signals only. Moving out, they worked their way quietly along, and as they neared the sounds of mining, a great clamor rang out through the shafts all about them, bringing with it the sounds of horrified screams and a battle joined. What's happening, Carmen whispered. It sounds like the miners are being attacked. Many residents of the dark would rather steal gold than work for it. Maybe they need help. Maybe, but we must be careful. We might end up between two trolls and their next meal. So that's where we'll leave off this episode on the bottom of page 212. We'll find out what happens to Carmen and her rangers and the gnomish miners next time, starting at the top of page 213. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, read the Drums of Doom, part two of the Dwarven New Staff Saga by me, and all the following novels culminating in the Ice Moon. Thank you and have a great night.